Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. America's military bases are under attack. John Conger, a former senior official at the Department of Defense, told me $8 billion worth of damage has been done to a number of military installations in the last 12 months. The insidious menace behind this destruction? Climate change. I know it's not exactly a typical enemy, nor is it completely responsible for extreme weather events. But the scientific community is clear that it has intensified potential disasters like storms, floods, and droughts. In October 2018, Hurricane Michael damaged every building at Florida's Tyndall Air Force Base. In Nebraska, flooding put parts of Offutt Air Force Base underwater. Moreover, climate change events threaten U.S. security interests abroad by exacerbating humanitarian disasters and migration crises. This type of destabilization can lead to conflict and violence across the world. Climate change is also paving the way for a high-stakes showdown between the U.S., Russia, and China in the Arctic. Therefore, the U.S. national security apparatus is worried. In fact, climate change is listed alongside terrorism and weapons of mass destruction in the 2019 Worldwide Threat Assessment of the U.S. intelligence community. Coincidentally, one analyst told me climate change is nuclear war in slow motion. So, how is the military preparing for this threat? And if they're taking climate change seriously, shouldn't the rest of us? Just three 2017 hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, cost $265 billion, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Maria was particularly deadly. Puerto Rico asserts the death toll is just shy of 3,000. Joshua Busby, an associate professor of public affairs at UT Austin, told me that if an agent with intent, like a terrorist organization, inflicted this type of damage, the US would bomb the hell out of them. 9-11, after all, led to two wars. Now, it's obviously impossible to wage a traditional military strike on natural disasters, but the US Department of Defense recognizes that the trend escalating the impact and frequency of extreme weather, i.e. climate change, both threatens the homeland and potentially can lead to violence abroad. Conger, formerly the Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, told me the DOD addresses climate change through three main questions. How does it affect my job today? How will it affect my job tomorrow? And what are the geopolitical implications? In January 2019, the Pentagon released a report addressing that first question, focusing on the present day. It paints a disturbing portrait showing that climate-related events are eroding domestic military infrastructure. In Alaska, for instance, Conger told me that melting permafrost underneath a radar facility is imperiling the system that it warns of an attack on the U.S. Other salient issues include drought, desertification, wildfires, and flooding. In fact, the study looked at 79 bases and found that two-thirds of them are impacted by recurrent flooding. Alice Hill, a senior director for Obama's National Security Council, told me this all boils down to operational readiness. If bases are closed or inaccessible because they are underwater or on fire, that means troops can't prepare for their mission, or it makes preparation more dangerous. In 2016, for instance, nine soldiers died in a training accident in Fort Hood during a flood. Hill added that climate events often happen in clusters, think hurricane season, so a series of consecutive events can undermine the military's ability to function. This also creates an ideal window for a hostile attack by a U.S. enemy. So, Conger told me the military is spending billions to prepare for the effects of climate change. He said most of this money is dedicated to infrastructure resilience. That's things like moving buildings away from shorelines, raising piers, and heightening seawalls. Peter Engelke, resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, told me these adaptive measures are all about defense. They sort of concede that climate change will grow stronger and we'll just have to adjust. On the other hand, Engelke told me the military doesn't prioritize offensive measures. They don't exert much effort trying to stop climate change. Given the U.S. military's large carbon footprint and the tremendous resources they have that can be dedicated to alternative energy research and development, this can feel like a glaring blind spot. But retired Rear Admiral David Titley told me the military isn't charged with solving all the world's problems. There are other government agencies that are better suited to lead climate research and development. Conger added that military leaders don't want to do anything that will curtail their mission. So if going green is more time consuming or more expensive, they are loath to do so. Hill told me the best way to get military leaders to think sustainably is to show them that green tech helps the mission. Fuel efficient vehicles need to be refueled less 
less often, for instance, which saves time. Hill added that stopping to refuel sometimes makes soldiers sitting ducks for terrorists, so energy efficiency can also save lives. Okay, so those are all present day issues. An example of climate change related security issues of the future is already underway in the Arctic. The Northern Sea Route is generally open for four weeks each summer due to seasonal melting. But as the temperature increases year round, that sea route will be open for significantly longer. This is really good news for Russia because it's a much shorter shipping route to Europe than the one that goes through the Suez Canal. Therefore, Russia is sending troops, ships, and weapons to the area in order to expand its sizable footprint there. China is also investing in equipment to take advantage of this climate change enabled shortcut. Conger told me that the US security challenge in the region is making sure the area doesn't become a Russian lake. That is, that it's not dominated by the Russians and is instead treated like a global commons. Busby added that a melting Arctic has the potential to change borders and historically, border disputes have often led to war. Okay, on to the third climate change national security issue, the geopolitical implications. In this realm, you often see climate change described as a threat multiplier or a stressor. That is, it doesn't cause conflicts, it just makes them worse. No wonder then that in the fourth national climate assessment, the word exacerbate appears 123 times. Consider Syria. Titley explained that a drought between 2006 and 2011 impoverished many rural farmers. They moved into urban urban areas in search of work. The poverty, lack of food, and overcrowding heightened the social tensions that ultimately led to the Syrian revolution and the subsequent civil war. The US has engaged in this war. Meanwhile, Conger told me that drought in the Lake Chad region in Nigeria made many locals discontent. That created ideal recruitment conditions for Boko Haram, the terrorist organization. Busby told me climate change is a particular problem in countries that meet three conditions. They have a high level of dependence on agriculture, there's a recent history of conflict in the area, and discriminatory political institutions that marginalize certain social groups are in control. By these criteria, countries including Angola, Yemen, Myanmar, and Pakistan are all at increased risk. Conger underscored Pakistan as a potential problem area, noting that it has a precarious water supply, tensions with its neighbor India, and nuclear weapons. So extreme weather there can exacerbate an already perilous situation. And keep in mind, extreme weather and the unrest it promotes can be a motivating factor for migration. Again, Titley pointed to Syria. The chain of events that included the prolonged drought and the civil war also includes a mass exodus of some 5.6 million desperate people, according to the United Nations. These refugees have put a political strain on Europe. This, in turn, has contributed to the rise of a brand of populism that threatens the cohesion of the EU. Furthermore, Hill told me that extreme heat has hurt agricultural production in Latin America and is likely a factor that motivates migration, legal or otherwise, to the US. Now, curtailing immigration has been a defining issue of the Trump presidency, so one might expect that climate-inspired migration might be of particular interest to him. But Trump has been unreceptive to climate science. He's criticized the intelligence community's assessment of climate change as a security threat. And of course, he's pledged to pull out of the Paris Agreement as soon as possible. Yet, despite the president's public skepticism of climate change, the experts I spoke to said the US government and the national security apparatus in particular continues to plan for the climate consequences bearing down on us. Admiral Titley told me the vast majority of Pentagon employees see themselves as above the political fray. They swear an oath to the constitution, not to a president or a political party. Conger added that Congress isn't as bad on the intersection of climate change and defense as you might think. He told me there's definitely a bipartisan appetite on the Hill to make sure the armed forces are able to address credible threats. And it's also worth pointing out that the director of national intelligence, the man who signed his name to the report that identified climate change as a global threat, is Trump nominated Dan Coats. Coats is a former Republican senator from Indiana. In other words, not exactly a lefty tree hugger. My point here is while climate change has become a contentious front in the culture wars, while there's a mass divide on the issue between liberals and conservatives, serious policymakers cannot be distracted by all the noise. The ICE doesn't care who's in the White House. It doesn't care which party controls your Congress. It doesn't care which party controls your parliament. It just melts. And look, the scientific community, the intelligence community, and the defense community all agree that climate change is a threat. Unfortunately, the solutions 
aren't as easy or as inexpensive as we might hope. Perhaps we have to pay a carbon tax to discourage fossil fuel use and encourage the adoption of sustainable energy. Perhaps we need to rethink the way we consume resources like water and arable land. Maybe that means a change to our meat heavy diets. None of this is ideal, but in generations past, the US population made sacrifices in the interest of national security. Perhaps the sacrifices made necessary by climate change will be easier to swallow if we see them as a patriotic duty. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.